Hi everyone, so in this lesson we're going to get to grips with the impact of trade unions and their collective bargaining and the potential impact this could have on a competitive labour market, perfectly competitive labour market, as well as a monopsony labour market where we're facing a sole buyer of labour. Okay, just to remind ourselves, trade unions act on the behalf of members to try and further the interests of the employees who are unionised members, of course. Okay, uh, and one of the key ways they do this is via this collective bargaining approach, where together they have a far greater voice, of course, and it gives them greater negotiating power. Okay, so firstly, let's have a look at uh, the potential impact of negotiating higher wages within a perfectly competitive labour market. Okay, let's start off with our market equilibrium. To start with, though, we can see supply equals demand, and so therefore we can determine that employment would be E star. Meanwhile, um, we would have a level of uh, wage at W star. Okay, uh, so there it is. Right, so the trade union comes along and they negotiate better wages for all, all unionised workers. Uh, and the impact of that would be, of course, to bring up the actual average wage rate. Uh, so if I just denote that by WTU, okay, we can see that there. And in effect, what happens is the supply curve, in effect, kinks because it means that for unionised workers, the lowest wage that they can actually be paid now is WTU. In effect, it has the same sort of repercussions as a minimum wage would in this marketplace. Uh, now, from this, we also see that we've got two inter interesting points to explore here and here. Okay. Now, the supply curve, in effect, is, uh, of course, the marginal cost curve, particularly when you consider that each worker is costing uh, the firm exactly the same amount. These workers that did have very low reservation wages here, the wage that they were prepared to offer their services for, um, well actually they, they will be earning a much greater wage uh, okay, under the trade union model uh, than they were in the competitive equilibrium here. Okay, so we can see at this point in effect marginal cost equals the marginal revenue product right there okay and we will just call that e1 uh, meanwhile we can see that the actual supply of labor at this wage rate would be equivalent to e2 so what does this mean for our marketplace well firstly it means that these people who had a reservation wage which was which was above the uh, market equilibrium well, they now enter the actual uh, lab potential labor force because they want to get a job now that they get paid in line with their uh, reservation wages or even slightly higher. So the, it means that the participation rate will increase. Okay, so the participation rate increases. Um, and so what does this mean? Well, it means that there's more workers potentially available. In effect, there is a surplus uh, to the level of demand. But we can also see that there is an increase in unemployment. Let's just highlight that with uh, the green pen there. OK, so unemployment, meanwhile, increases from E star to E1. So some people lose their jobs under this, uh, this collective bargaining approach. OK, so a union, union certainly benefits many members who enjoy this higher wage up to E1, but thereafter, the workers from E1 to E star are made unemployed. Okay, so that's an interesting outcome here that we can see. We, we're left with a surplus of uh, available workers in the uh, marketplace. Um, so, yeah, very, very interesting because it completely disrupts the market equilibrium here. Okay, uh, and in effect, of course, it means that the labor market is no longer allocatively efficient, so that in that case, there is market failure in action. Okay, previously the market was clearing, of course. Okay, so let's now, uh, oh, before we do that, let's just remind ourselves that unemployment now has actually increased um, from E1 right through to E2, and that's an important point to be aware of. Uh, the key reason for that, of course, is that the participation rate of labour has actually increased. The more people are in the work, uh, the labour market. 
Okay, uh, so let's now uh, just remind ourselves of uh, monopsony labour market. Here we've got the marginal cost above the supply curve, and that is simply because that to attract additional workers you need to pay everyone the same higher wage rate. Okay, so we can see that with this uh, marginal cost here above the actual uh, supply curve. MC equals the MRP at this point, so if we just take that down, and we can just call that EM for employment and monopsony. Okay, so what wage rate does this give rise to? Well, remember to track it down to the level of supply. Okay, so we reach the supply curve here, and we therefore have WM, wage and monopsony labour market. So it's below uh, the competitive equilibrium, of course. Okay, so we can see that there. Now, if the trade union is able to embark on this collective bargaining and negotiate those higher wages, well, it means potentially wages could increase. I'd always highlight this point. It gives you a nice one to actually uh, focus in on, and it keeps the diagram nice and straightforward. Okay, there's nothing wrong with doing this at a different point, but I'd just focus in on this point. Uh, and I'm sure the reasons why will become clear as I just go through this. Okay, so we can see WTU um, in line with supply and demand. Okay, um, meanwhile, the employment level is ETU. So this is interesting because we see an increase in the wage and we see an increase in employment. Uh, okay, so th that's an interesting case study for us to actually see here. We can also see that that area of deadweight loss that we had previously looked at is now actually reduced by the trade union. So it does help to actually increase employment, increase wages, and reach a more allocatively efficient level. And of course, in this example, I've said it's exactly allocatively efficient. In reality, of course, that's highly unlikely, and that'd be a nice point to make. Okay, um, so, interesting example there. Now, we could take this a little bit further though. So, if you take it a little bit further, you'll be showing off how good an economist you really are, okay? And if you consider a union with much greater bargaining power, with um, highly unionised workers, then we could perhaps have, oh, sorry, let's just to note that as WTU. One, okay, um, so WTU1 is if we have a really dominant, really militant trade union who is able to bid up the wages uh, to a much, much higher level. If they're able to bid up the wages, let's put that in red, okay, then we see that big increase in the actual wage taking place there, okay. Um, so the employment, meanwhile, has not actually changed. So in terms of the actual outcome here, well, we're not necessarily going to be uh, more allocatively efficient, but the workers will receive a better wage, assuming that they maintain their jobs, okay? In this example, we saw they didn't maintain their jobs. Okay, so there's an, a number of likely impacts that we need to assess the, the potential impact of this on though, okay? So I've just denoted these uh, down here, and we can see number one, Firstly, we need to consider how powerful the trade union really is, okay? Um, the more power they have, the greater their negotiating skills, of course. Uh, what about the extent of membership? If they don't have every worker on board, then it's going to be more difficult to negotiate those higher wages. What about the level of militancy? The more militant they are, the more willing they are to, to pursue strike action or overtime bans or work to rule where they just fulfil their job descriptions and nothing else, then the more likely they are to actually get their way. Okay, um, number two, which labour markets actually dominate in the UK economy and other economies? Uh, so whatever you are actually focusing in on there, okay? Um, so that gives you another interesting example to focus on. And what about trade union impact on dynamic efficiency? So particularly with our monopsony labour market, if they are imp improving working conditions and increasing wages, then how will that actually affect the cost base and how might it actually reduce supernormal profits and the prof prospect of dynamic efficiency? 
Number four, what impact does it have on an allocative efficiency? Well, it depends again on the actual strength, the power of the trade union. The more power they have, the higher they will be able to negotiate those wages. But there's many other areas you could explore here. So for instance, you could pursue uh, the extent to which uh, the demand for labor is inelastic. The more inelastic demand for labor is, perhaps because the labor isn't easily substituted for by capital goods, then the greater the negotiating power of the trade union is likely to be. In addition to that, how profitable is the firm? The more profitable the firm is, the greater the negotiating power the trade union will have once again. Okay, it's a lovely topic this for SA, so I really hope this comes up this year. Thanks, guys.